right, guys, let's get started. Uh, again, DJ Mushu is back in town. Thank you for being here. Um, so I think we finally worked out all the kinks. So I should be recording audio. The DJ is playing over the head, the overhead speakers. Um, I got the clicker working. My uh, I bought new shoes, so that doesn't sound like I'm on like a basketball court all the time. Uh, so we should be good to go. Um, why the hell did you come to my house on Friday night? I need help getting my equipment back. Yeah, but like at midnight? What am I gonna do? I okay. I'm just getting a bunch of people. You know, we gotta roll deep. We gotta do whatever it takes. All right. Please don't come to my house at midnight. I don't care what you're trying to do. Just don't do that. Okay. Sorry. All right. Um, for you guys in the class, uh. The things that are on your schedule, uh, homework one and homework or project zero, are both due next this Sunday on at midnight. Um, project uh, one will be count for your real grade. That'll be released later this week. Um, and then, as we posted on Piazza tonight, we're having an info session where we will go through a bunch of different ways to set up your laptops for Windows, OS X, both Intel and ARM, and the uh, on Linux to get the development environment set up for uh, the projects, okay? Questions, yes. So the question is, if, 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 you're, if you can do Project Zero on your laptop or your development environment, will you be okay the rest of the semester? Yes. We, the question is, will you be okay without valve grinds? I mean, like, can you drive a car without a seatbelt? Right, like, yes, but do you want to? He says yes. No, I don't do that. Any other questions? Is the question about, what's the question about Valgrind? Yes. Yes, go ahead. The question is, will the, the info session be recorded? If we can't make it, yes, yes, it will be. And then we'll post it on a uh, uh, box for only, because we can't put, because it'd be students talking, we can't put it on YouTube. So this will be on uh, Fox. We'll, we'll post a link on Piazza. And all the project recitations going forward will also be available and recorded as well. Okay? Okay. Um, actually, let me reset. Sorry, this is being stupid. Let me reset this. There we go. That's better. Okay. Uh, yes, let's double check that. As far as I can tell, sound is recording. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, so last class, we spent time, or last two lectures, we spent time talking about what a database looks like at the logical level, the high level, what the application programmer sees, right? So we, we learn how to write SQL, we learn how to you know, declare tables and relational model. So from this lecture and going forward pretty much the rest of the semester, now it's all about how do you build the database system, they build the software that's gonna expose that SQL API, expose tables and relations to, to, uh, to programmers, to the end user, right? So it's really about the internals of the system, how do we actually materialize and generate a, a system a database system that can achieve the SQL capabilities and the storage uh, that we want. So you'll, we're hoping to have uh, the ability for Bustop to support SQL and the projects going forward. But pretty much at this point, we don't really need to understand uh, you know, all the stuff we're doing in homework one and SQL. We'll just see how, actually, how do we actually implement these things, OK? So the overall course outline is as follows. And so the way to think about what we're going to go through is going through the different layers of a database management system. So this is a high level abstraction or high level view of what a database system looks like. But you can basically think of it as a bunch of layers in software where each layer is going to make certain guarantees or expose a certain API to the layer above it and uses whatever it comes below it. So we've already talked about relational databases. So the order we're going to go through the rest of the semester is we're first going to talk about how do you actually store data in a database, on a database system? How do you then execute queries? How do you run multiple queries at the same time? Um, how do you deal with the, the, the database if there's a crash and make sure you don't lose any data? And then we'll finish up the semester talking about distributed databases. So for, at a high level, pretty much for, the, for now until around Thanksgiving, we're going to be only talking about a single node system. Because trust me, you want to you deal with a single node first before you bring in multiple nodes or multiple machines, because it's going to make your life a lot easier. Uh, and then once we understand the, the fundamentals of how to build a single node database system, we can then see what do we need to change to make it distributed, to make it run on multiple machines. And then we'll finish up with a potpourri session talking about a bunch of random stuff uh, that I think is important and interesting, which sort of goes beyond the, the fundamentals. So for today's lecture and the next two, three lectures, we're going to start at the lowest level, the disk manager. Right? How do we actually represent a database on disk? What does it mean to go get a page from disk? What's inside of it? And so forth. OK? Because this is going to affect how we architect the rest of the, of the system. 
So one key idea we need to understand for, for this semester is that we'll be talking about what is called a disk-based architecture, disk-oriented database system. And this basically means that the software is going to be designed uh, to assume that the database resides, the primary storage location of the database is on some kind of non-volatile storage, non-volatile disk. SSD, spinning disk hard drive, it doesn't matter at this point. And then the components we're going to build in the system of uh, these different layers is going to allow us to manage the movement of data back and forth from the, the non-volatile disk and the, the, the volatile storage memory. Right? This is a classic von, von Neumann architecture where we have the data at rest sitting on disk. And anytime we want to manipulate it or do something with it, we have to bring it into memory so the CPU can crunch on it. Now, some, there's some GPUs and things like that can, that can break that abstraction. But for our purposes here, let's assume that. So the big thing we'll see going forward throughout not this class, but the next week, and what you'll be building in project one is that a lot of the system is going to be designed to, with this assumption that the data you need is on disk. And that means that any time you go read a page, go read something, it may not be in memory, and it's on disk, and you got to go get it. you got to coordinate the system to deal with that back and forth. OK? So I always show this uh, every year. The way to think about this is, is the storage hierarchy that we're going to think about is sort of as follows. And you might have seen this. I know this is in the textbook. You might have seen this in, uh, in, uh, in other diagrams and other things. Um, so the way to think about this hierarchy is that the bottom layer, we're going to have storage that's going to be uh, very slow, but much larger and much cheaper. And as we go up the stack, the size of, the, of the, this device, the amount of data we can store in it, is going to get smaller and smaller. It's going to get much faster, uh, but it's also going to be way more expensive. So the most extreme storage you can have are CPU registers. Right? These are you know, small things you can store 64 bits and literally sit on the CPU. And that's what the instructions operate on. And at the bottom, you have something like network storage. I think in the, in the textbook, they have magnetic tapes at the bottom. I mean, I'm assuming nobody knows what that is. Uh, it's, it's how people do things in the old days. You primarily only use it for like, long-term archival. Like Amazon has a service called Glacier. It's literally like these tape drives, cassette tapes, that a robot arm puts in and out if you ever need to retrieve anything. But it's like super long latencies. So the exact speed differences between these different levels is not going to matter for this semester. The thing that we are going to care about is this division line here where anything above it is going to be considered volatile. And that means that it's going to be, if I pull the power, I'm going to lose whatever was stored in it. Um, but this, this, these storage devices are going to support random access, meaning I can jump to any offset in the storage device and get it with roughly the same, the same speed as any other offset. Um, and, that, and by that means, it's byte addressable. Right? Anything below that will be non-volatile. Uh, and it's obviously going to be slower. But it's going to have what is called block addressable access, meaning I can't jump to a single exact like, memory location and just get the you know, 64 bits in there. I got to go get the block or the page that contains the data that I want. And even though I may only want 64 bits, I got to get the whole thing. Right? In some cases, too, the, the speed in which I can access data from these non-volatile devices will be faster if I'm doing sequential access versus random access. Everybody, everybody take a guess what I mean by that. Yes. Yes. Right. So what he means, what I mean by this is like what he said. He's, he's absolutely correct. It basically means that if I need to get one megabyte of data, and those exactly one megabytes are all contiguous on on the actual physical device, it's not exactly true, but I mean, for the most part, assume it is, then that's going to be way faster than getting one megabytes in one kilobyte chunks where I got to jump around to different locations. The easiest way to think about this is a spinning disk hard drive. No laptop comes within them anymore, right? but they still exist in, uh, in, in lar large storage, of, uh, you know, storage appliances where it's a spinning disk, think of like a vinyl record, and there's an arm that jumps around to jump, you know, to do seeks and things like that. So if I have to have that arm jump around to go get my one megabyte in a bunch of other locations, that's a physical movement, right? That's, that's something happening in the real world. That's going to be much, much slower than plopping the arm down once and reading things sequentially, right? So even in SSDs, just because the way that they're actually implemented and how things look like underneath, um, even then, like, even though it is, there are no physical devices, like it's a solid state storage, it's just doing you know, electronic uh, communication between the different circuits. In these things, it's still going to be faster to do sequential access versus random access. Right? And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff above in the operating system and how do you queue the request and so forth. Like, 
in general, sequential access is going to be preferable over random access. And we'll see as we design our algorithms when we execute queries and do other things in our database system, we're going to want to choose algorithms or implementations that uh, on paper, if you take an algorithms course, it seems like it's, it's a slower thing to do. But because we can maximize random or maximize sequential access, we're actually going to get better performance. So for this, this class, this semester here, uh, we're going to assume that whenever we talk about memory, we mean this, this, this DRAM, right? We're not going to worry about the CPU caches or CPU registers. That's things we'll cover in 721 in the advanced class. For our purposes here, if it's in memory, we just say that that's good enough for us. Right? There are ways to you know, take advantage of registers and CPU caches to do certain operations more efficiently. But at the end of the day, the disk is so much slower that as long as it's in DRAM, that's good enough for us. And so again, for, throughout the semester, when I refer to disk, I'm just going to say it's, it's anything down here, right? Again, and this is up in the CPU. Now, there are devices that sort of try to span this, uh, these different levels and try to get sort of best of both worlds. So there is fast network storage, things like Affiniband, uh, or, or RDMA over, over uh, TCP or Ethernet, right? There are things that kind of, kind of look like they could be uh, you know, treat them as if they're, you know, random access and non-volatile. Uh, but you, get, you can't get fast network storage. The thing that I was super excited about was this thing called persistent memory. Who here has ever heard of this for Intel Optane? Okay, a few guys. All right, this thing was amazing because the promise of this, if you actually have this, it looks like DRAM, it smells like DRAM, even goes in the DRAM dim slots on your motherboard. But like, if you pull the plug, you you don't lose any data, right? So this is actually something that when I started at CMU that my, I worked on with my first PhD student, who's now faculty at Georgia Tech, uh, we ended up writing a book about this kind of stuff. Like to me, this was a game changer because all the crap we talked about this semester of like moving things back and forth through the buffer pool, a lot of the algorithms we talked about this semester would all go away if you actually had this device, if you had the storage device that could look like DRAM, but it was, it was non-volatile, right? And then lo and behold, Intel actually had, had, had this device. Uh, so they called it Intel Optane. So this is amazing. This was like, Again, it looks like DRAM, but from the application standpoint, you can rely on the fact that it's non-volatile, right? Let me say, guess what happened? Do you want to know the story? No, Intel killed it. Yeah, this is this is two or three weeks ago. No, it's a, 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 end of July, right? So Intel was not making any money on this. They hired they hired a new CEO, so they cut a bunch of things. And the one thing that sadly to say they, they've killed off is the Intel memory, right? A bunch of other manufacturers claimed they had sort of devices that look like this. Uh, IBM had something. HP was supposed to have this thing called memristors. They bet the farm on it, but then that, that fell through. Uh, Hynix was supposed to have something. Um, Intel was the first one that stepped up into this, and they basically didn't have a market, uh, which is kind of sad. Right, this would be a radical change if you had this. As I said, you basically change how you build all your software. Uh, and <laughs> I have to bleep that out was actually building a database system that actually was relying on this, but this has been dead. Um, so th this, this is sad. And I don't see this happening in the next decade, because basically everybody's going to be gun shy, because if Intel could make money off of it, who else will try this? So we'll see. Maybe it's another 10 years. All right, so this, this is gone. All right, so you may have seen this chart as well. This is, this is oftentimes labeled as latency numbers every programmer should know. It's sometimes attributed to uh, Jeff Dean. I think they're... Uh, the mid 2000s, I've seen uh, Jim Gray, another famous database researcher, have similar numbers. But this is a way to sort of think about to understand how expensive it is to get stuff from disk and why we're going to go design algorithms to try to re reduce that uh, back and forth. And so the exact numbers aren't, uh, they change every year. Uh, there's a website on, uh, at Berkeley where you can have a little slider and see how these numbers evolve over time. But roughly, think about an L1 cache reference is going to take you one nanosecond. Um, and then, you know, if we start from DRAM, that's 100 nanoseconds. But once you get to the non-volatile storage, like an SSD, now you're around uh, 16 microseconds. A spinning disk hard drive is two, mil two, uh, two milliseconds, which is actually pretty good. Um, and then network storage would be something like EBS or S3. Th you know, this, this, this can fluctuate from like 50 milliseconds to maybe like, you know, 500 milliseconds, depending what happens. And then again, this is the tape archives that no one would actually use. So it's kind of hard to wrap your head around these numbers in nanoseconds, because humans, we don't think of typically in nanoseconds. So if you just replace the numbers with one nanosecond equals one second, now you actually see how huge a difference this actually is. And so the metaphor that Jim Gray likes to use, that I like to use, uh, is just thinking about what it would take to actually read a page in a book. 
right? So reading an L1 like CPU cache and SRAM would be like me having the book right in front of me and just finding the page and reading it. Whereas if it's an L2 cache miss, then I got to go maybe walk to his, to his desk and go read it. And all the way down would be the tape archives, right? 31 years. This is equivalent to like flying to Pluto to read one page in a book, right? It's orders of magnitude slower. This is why we want to avoid this at all costs. And even reading from a fast SSD, uh, like 16 microseconds is pretty good, but it's still going to take you, you know, four hours compared to, you know, one second. So again, we're trying to maximize the, the, the amount of work we can do with data we have in memory and reduce our, our read and writes uh, to disk. So these numbers, I think, are in, in reads. In some devices, writes are actually slower. SSDs, writes are slower because there's, there's more work I have to do. But it's roughly the same order of magnitude difference between these different levels. OK? And so this one we also covered as well. Um, again, I'll just, just say it again, that the, the, the non-volatile storage is going to be much better to access using sequential I.O. Um, again, it doesn't matter if it's a reads or writes. Sequential is always going to be better. And we're going to try to choose algorithms and try to maximize this. And again, this may look different from what you see in, in an algorithms course where you just assume everything's in memory and everything has equal access uh, characteristics. But on, on real hardware, it makes a difference. OK? And I'll try as we go along to talk about maybe some of the assumptions that the, the textbook would make or, or some of the algorithms we'll talk about that they'll make, assuming you have like really old, slow disks and how the, the, the SSDs are making this a little bit better. But still, sequential access will will be problematic. All right, so the overall goal we're trying to build in a disk-oriented system is to build, build software that can manage a database that exceeds the amount of memory that's available to, to the hardware, to, to the system itself. Right? So again, because reading and writing a disk is super expensive, we want to be clever about how we're going to move data back and forth to avoid large stalls and avoid performance degradation as our database grows uh, larger and larger. Right? And again, because sequential access is better, we'll choose algorithms, choose methods to, 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 to maximize sequential I.O. So at a high level, the database system is going to look like this. So we have some kind of non-volatile storage, and then we're going to have a database file. And then the database file is going to be broken up into pages. So sometimes I've heard of these blocks. Sometimes I've heard of these pages. They basically mean the same thing. And then above our division line, we'll have, uh, we'll have memory. And this is going to have a buffer pool manager that can have some location in memory where it can copy pages in and out. Right? Sometimes the textbook might say, uh, sometimes they're called buffer managers uh, or page caches. Again, they all basically mean the same thing. It's, it's memory that's being managed by uh, the database system to move pages in and out from disk. And then there's some upper level part of the system. We'll just call this an execution engine. Right? When I showed that course outline in the beginning, these are just the upper parts. We don't care what it is. We just know that something's requesting this. And they're going to come to the buffer pool manager and say, I want page two. And then we'll look at this page directory that we'll talk about in a second. And it's going to tell you, OK, if you need page two, here's the, here's the, here's the location on disk where to go find it. And then we'll copy it into our buffer pool and then get back the execution engine a pointer to page two in the memory that we've allocated here. And then now that the system can go do whatever it wants with that page and interpret the layout, make changes to it, do whatever, you know, do whatever it needs to do to execute queries or whatever it's asking to do, right? So in some ways, this part of the system here doesn't really need to know what's actually inside these pages, right? Is it an index? Is it table? Is it table Y, table X? Doesn't matter. It's the upper level parts of the system that are going to handle this for us. Now, in cases where we can give hints up above and say, hey, I'm accessing this page and it's going to be used in a certain way, then there's some optimizations we can do at these different levels. But at, at high level, it doesn't matter. Yes? The question is, between the execution engine and the buffer pool, only bytes are being passed? Uh, so it'd be, it's, you'd get a 64-bit a, like a pointer to a page in memory. Right? So th this is, this is, think of this as like all within the process space of, 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 the, of the data system. And so when he says, give me page two, you get a pointer back to page two. Yes? His question is, is the database file one file on disk or, is, or multiple files? It depends on the implication. We'll get that in a second. The answer is SQLite, one file, no systems, multiple files. Yes? All right, well, we'll get to this in a second. So his question is, which, 
you're actually yeah, you're jumping ahead. His statement is, hey, this sounds like virtual memory. It does. We'll see why we don't want to use virtual memory in the operating system in like two slides. That's, 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 that's a very good point. So just, again, outline where we're going. For this piece here, we'll talk about this in the next uh, two, three lectures, including this one today. The bumper pool, again, which will be project one will be based on, will be lecture six next week. And then all this other stuff, how to build the execution engine, we'll cover later on. All right, so he basically hit the nail on the head. What does this sound like? OS virtual memory, right? So why would you want, why are we going to spend time in our database system re-implementing the wheel if potentially the operating system can already do this for us, right? So in particular, in, under POSIX, you can have what is called uh, memory mapped I.O. or MMAP. And there's, there's a sys call called MMAP to do this for you. And basically what that does is MMAP, you give it a location to a file on disk, and then the operating system will, will set up the pages, sort of virtual memory, in your process uh, that maps to individual, the pages on that file. So now if my, uh, my thread tries to read some location in the file uh, through, through that memory address, the OS is responsible for, for bringing it in to, into memory, and then I get a pointer to it to do whatever I want. And then if I run out of space uh, in, my, in, my, in my process, the OS can, can page things out as needed, right? So roughly it looks like this. You have an on-disk file. Uh, you call MMAP, and then you get a bunch, of, um, a bunch of virtual pages set up. And then if your thread comes along and says, I want page one, the operating system knows says, OK, well, I want page one. It's this offset in the file. Then they get to copy it into my virtual memory. And then, uh, then the thread can do whatever it wants with it, right? And then we do a mapping from virtual memory to physical memory. Off I need page three, same thing, copy it in here, and then I can do whatever I want. Now the challenge comes along is what, when I need page two, right? What happens here? Well, the operating system has to say, you know, I don't have any more spaces in my virtual memory. I got to go make space. But what's, what, you know, the, what page is actually going to remove from physical memory to make space for the new one? depends on a bunch of different factors, and it may actually not be the right thing that you actually want for your database system, right? In actuality, what's, I mean, what, what really is going to happen here is your thread's going to stall, right? Whatever thread says, I want this, you know, you touch a memory location, you try to do whatever you want on it, the, the OS says there's a page fall interrupt, it says the page you want is not in physical memory, stalls your thread, and then the, the disk scheduler go fetches it in and puts it in for you. So now your thread's just sitting there when it could be actually doing useful work. So. The, the big problems also comes up too. If now we have multiple threads trying to access um, MMAP files, right? Because you're trying to have these page stalls. Maybe like I'll have one thread be the dispatcher to say, okay, go do whatever I need to do uh, on this page. And then that way, if there's a stall, that thing can get blocked and I can go off and do, do, still, do, still do more useful work. You do a bunch of these things, the tricks to get around these problems, but essentially you're going to build a database system in the end, right? So I've had a long standing, fuse not the right word. Uh, just, obsession with why MMAP for database is a bad idea. Uh, I mean, I'm writing a paper about it. So let me go to sort of the, the four key problems of why you don't want to use the operating system for this. And this will be a reoccurring theme throughout the entire semester, is that the operating system is not your friend, it's your database system. It's always going to get in the way, and we're going to try to avoid it as much as possible. And all the major database systems will do this. Postgres has one exception that we'll talk about. But in general, you don't want to rely on the operating system to do anything uh, other than just you know, give you memory and, and make sure your process doesn't get killed. Uh, we want to do everything ourselves inside the database system. The reason why we want to do this is because the database system is always going to know better than the operating system. Right? We know what the queries are. We know what's actually in the data, we being in the database system. Uh, and the operating system just sees a bunch of like, you know, blind reads and writes on files or, or memory locations. It doesn't know what you're trying to do. Doesn't know that there's a transaction also running that needs to touch this page, and you got to wait for them. Like, there's a whole bunch of complications or, or other sort of knowledge we have about why we want to do certain things in the database system that the OS simply can't know. So we want to avoid them as much as possible. All right. So the first problem we're going to have if we use MMAP is transaction safety. So we'll get into what it means or what transaction means. But think about if I write to a page uh, because I did an update query. When should I actually write it out to disk? Right? Ideally, I want to write it out when I know the transaction is committed. But the operating system is free to write, free to write it out anytime you want. You can call mlock on it to basically lock the page to keep it in memory, but that doesn't prevent the, the OS from writing out the dirty data. So now maybe the case where I do an update, but I don't want to save all my changes yet because I'm updating multiple pages. And then the OS flushes out your page 
you crashed before you updated all the other pages, and now you come back and you have torn writes. All right, so that's a problem. The next one we already talked about is the I.O. stalls. Right? The, the database system doesn't know which pages are in memory because this is all transparent for you, for the operating system hides all this from you. And so now if, if a thread tries to touch data that's not in memory, there's a page fault, and you get stalled, and then you, 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 know, you don't get the thread back, you don't get scheduled again until the, the data you want is available. So again, you have to basically deal a bunch of crap to like prevent this, or basically have other threads do asynchronous I.O., but by then you're basically building all the buffer pool stuff that we're talking about anyway this semester. The, le the next problem is error handling. Um, so one is the, the database system is going to maintain checksums on every page to make sure that data is, is correct uh, when it comes in and out. And you can actually check when the page comes in if you control the reads and writes to know, like, is this thing correct or no, and therefore throw errors if this happens. Uh, you can't do that easily with MMAP because the OS is hiding the, the in and out. And then anytime there's like a failure because like the, the file's corrupted or you can't get something from the file system, you don't get an exception because that's the operating system. You get a SIG bus interrupt, right? And then now you have to have throughout your entire database, you have to have handler code to handle those signals because some thread might be doing something at any given time and the signal shows up and now you have to have code that actually handles that. Whereas if you build it with a sort of the, the abstraction layers that I talked about, we can isolate the checks to see is this data corrupted or not within just the, the disk manager portion and not have signal handling everywhere else. And the last one also too, the last one is gonna be obviously performance issues. Uh, for really small databases and really like sort of light contention workloads, MMAP might be okay. But if you want to have build high performance systems, then the OS is gonna have its own internal data structure for its own page table, and that's gonna become a bottleneck for, for your thread, for your system. There's also TLB shootdowns where, like, if you, you, you have to remove something from, from your, your the translation uh, look aside buffer on hardware, you got to send a message to all the other cores to see if they get the update. So, at, at large scale, MMAP is a problem. So, as I said, yes? So, he, talked, so he says it, even if you build a buffer pool, uh, which you call malloc on get data, it's still going to use virtual memory. How do you how do you still avoid all these issues? Uh, because the like the contention problems will all be in in our system, right? So we can have we can build sort of a, a we can basically build a, 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 a our own scheduler that does all this access stuff. So it's only sort of one or two threads doing all this, rather than multiple threads trying to do this together. Oh, so, sorry. No, the OS, OS won't page that out. Uh, so, like, swapping? Uh, yeah, we take this offline. Like, you basically set up the system and you turn off all that crap. You, like, you turn off all, like, like the swappiness and all that. You, you tweak the kernel parameters to do that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the question is, th sorry, don't use MMAP, or you, like bare metal in terms of like, uh, say, like a unikernel? Yeah, if, if we're the only thing that's running on the system, we get rid of the OS and just use the kernel. Okay. Yeah, so his question is, uh, if the operating system is so terrible, uh, has anybody actually tried to build databases that run like extreme bare metal? Right. When you say bare metal now, it usually means like you're running on like an EC2 where you don't get a VM, right? But you're talking about even more extreme. Like I'm running my own my own like unikernel that only has a database system, doesn't run a sound driver or whatever else Linux does. Um, nobody does that because the engineering effort to do that would be quite significant because you end up building your own operating system. Uh, I haven't seen anybody recently try to build unikernels for databases. People have done, um, there's, other, there's other inefficiencies in the operating system that you want to fix before you even get to like, throw all Linux away, right? Um, let me get an example. The file system is usually a problem. So like you can do like, uh, are, in the 80s, people used to build their own file systems. Actually, you can still get that Oracle in the DB2. So like when you buy an SSD or buy some storage device, you don't, you don't format it with the EXT4 or EXT3. You literally just take raw, like raw bytes and you build your own or file system on top of that. 
people have done that. People rewrite their own. Uh, they, they'll do thread scheduling in the database themselves. So Microsoft does that. Uh, Yellow Brick does this. There's a bunch of other things you can rewrite before you go extreme and, and remove all the kernel. Um, it, the engineering effort to do that is so significant. It's probably not worth it. I would say, for my example of the file system one, I know in the 80s, I've seen numbers that basically say, if you remove the file system, you maybe get a 10% boost in performance. So it's like, that's not worth it. You're not going to get like 100x with that effort. OK. So I don't want to dwell too much on MMAP to say it's a bad idea. The reason why I'm banging on it is because uh, we, we have all these people come and give talks at CMU. And to my surprise, a lot of them say they're using MMAP. Um, and I always ask why, because it seems like a bad idea. And usually the response comes back is, oh, it was quick and easy in the beginning. Um, but then later on, they find out that that was a bad idea, uh, and they have a lot of problems. So the, so the three most famous systems, or four most famous systems that are used MMAP uh, would be ModeADB, which is an analytical system. So it's, it's mostly doing read queries. LMD, LMDB, which is an uh, embedded uh, key value store. RavenDB is a document store like Mongo. And then LevelDB was implemented by, uh, by Google as their sort of key value store. Um, and Elastic and QuestDB uses, uses this uh, partially, or uses this as well. So down here, for parcel uses, MongoDB, single store, and InfluxDB, uh, these systems all got rid of this. Right? They no longer use MMAP. They, they, now build, you know, they now manage memory themselves in the way we're talking about this semester. And it's again, because of all the problems that, that I've talked about. It got them up and running quick, quick, you know, quick and dirty to get something going, like an MVP of the database system. But then, as this, as they try to push the system further and further, MMAP falls apart and betrays them. Um, you know, I, I don't want to pick on Mongo, but like to use them as an example, like they were the hot system uh, in the mid two thousands or early 2000s, 2010s, tens, um, and they had all the money in the world, right? And they're based on MMAP, and with, they had really great engineers with all this money. If MMAP was really the right choice, they could have made it work potentially. And instead, what do they do? They threw away the MMAP engine, bought a company called Wire Tiger that didn't use MMAP, and that's what they use today. Right? Single Store has a blog article that basically says, hey, we started off with MMAP, and it turns out it was a bad idea. Here's why. Right? This, this is a reoccurring theme over and over again. Um, the LMDB guy, like, he's the exact opposite of me. I think MMAP's the, a terrible idea. He thinks MMAP is the greatest idea. And he, he sends emails. Uh. <laughs> anyway, all right. So, Again, the main thing about this is that, again, we'll see this in other things in, in, throughout the semester, is the database system is almost always going to want to control everything themselves because we can always do a better job than the operating system. Right? Think of the operating system as a generic like pickup truck. Like, yeah, you can take it racing on a, on a you know, I guess Formula One cars, but you're going to lose. Whereas if we build a system that's customized for exactly how, the, you know, what queries we're going to execute, uh, what the data is going to look like, we can always do things in, in, a, in a better way. These are a bunch of different things that, that we'll see throughout the semester. Like, we can do prefetching in a way the operating system really can't do. Like, it, it can, MMAP can do some prefetching, but only if it's sequential access. It can't do, doesn't know the high level meaning of the data structure and how pages are connected together. And we can, we can prefetch much better than it can. All right, so again, the OS is not your friend. If I die this semester, and put, you know, put, use never MMAP on your database on my grave. Um, and this is the paper that we actually published this year uh, that goes through all the problems that I'm talking about here today. And if you follow that link, there's a there's a 10 minute like YouTube video or, that describes all these problems in further detail. Okay. All right. So, to, there's a long uh, answer to his question. We don't want to use virtual memory. It's going to be a problem. All right. Okay. So I'll say with Postgres, Postgres doesn't use uh, virtual memory. It does use the OS page cache for the file system. That'll cause problems later on, but we we can cover that uh, as we go further. All right. So. For database storage, there's two questions. How are we actually going to represent the, the database in files on disk? And then how are we actually going to ma manage the memory to move data, those, those, those pages back and forth from disk? So today's lecture and next lecture will be about this. And then the buffer pool lecture on, uh, will be next, next Thursday. And again, that'll be project one. OK? All right, so today's agenda, we're going to first talk about file storage, uh, what these files are actually going to look like. Then we'll go inside the files and say what do the pages look like, and then we'll go inside the pages and say what the tuples are going to look like. Okay. And I'll say also too that that what I'm describing here is uh, is sort of the the canonical implementation of a database system. 
um, with these files and these pages and so forth. There'll be another architecture we'll talk about on Thursday this week called a log structure storage or log structure merge tree storage. Uh, and that's going to look slightly different, but at the end of the day, it's still going to be files and pages and so forth. Okay. But pretty much all the systems you can think about today, uh, that's actually not true. It's probably less true because of RocksDB, but most of the systems are classic database system will, will look like what we're talking about here. Okay. All right. So the database system is going to be a software that we're going to build that's going to manage the database as one of our files uh, on disk. And typically, the file format is going to be pr proprietary to the database system, meaning I can't take a SQLite file and have Postgres interpret it. Right? It's not, not a CSV file with a bunch of text that I can parse. It's going to be a format specific to the database system. Now, there's going to be uh, sort of open source file formats that we'll talk about uh, next week, like Parquet or Orc or Avro, where these try to be sort of generic file formats that any database system can, can interpret. But in general, for the high performance ones, it's always going to be a uh, proprietary format. And furthermore, the operating system is not going to know anything about what these, what these files are. It right? doesn't know what's inside of them, doesn't know that how things are connected. It just sees files. Right? And you can open up the, 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 the terminal, look, look in your file system, and you just see a bunch of files. So uh, this last point brings up the question he had about, like, can you ever just go bare metal? And again, people tried this in the 1980s, uh, but no one pretty much does this today. Everyone sort of assumes you're building files off of a uh, you know, WinFS, ext 4 whatever the generic file system you have. Or if it's cloud storage, like S3 or Azure storage, right? whatever those APIs are. So the storage manager is going to be responsible for maintaining these database files. And the again, it's just it's figuring out where the files are located, what the director hierarchy is. Um, some will have their own dispatcher so that when a thread inside the database system or a process inside the database system goes and reads a, reads a page, it can then schedule that for you. Or you can let the operating system do the read, read for, for you as well. And so the, there are other optimizations you can do based on you know, the sequential read versus random read that we talked about. And the, the dispatcher can be clever about scheduling those things together in, in batches to improve performance. And then within our files, we're going to break them up into a collection of pages. And essentially, the storage manager is responsible for getting the pages that are requested by the upper levels of the system and then keeping track of what, maybe what threads are reading or writing to a given page at a given time. It also keeps track of available space. May need to run compaction to, to, you know, to defragment the, the pages as we go along, but we'll, we'll talk about that later, right? And for this discussion today as well, we're just going to assume that the pages only contain tuples, right? The, the actual records in the in the tables, um, but they really could contain anything, right? They contain log files, they contain uh, index information or indexes, data structures, right? But for our purposes here, just assume that it's tuples and everything still works. So a page is going to be a fixed lock, fixed size block of data, um, and again, it, it can contain anything. Typically, most database systems will not mix page types, meaning within one page, I can't have index data and, and table data. It's for simplicity. It's usually going to be for table X Y Z. Here's a page, and it, and, and it only contains data for X Y Z. Right? It's not, it's not going to mix data from other different pages. Uh, some systems will require pages to be self-contained. And what I mean by that is all the metadata, all the information you need to know to how to interpret what's inside the page has to be contained in the page in itself. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, see what those, we'll, we'll see why you want to do this in, in a second. Every page is going to be given a unique identifier, simply called a page ID or a block number. Um, and then there'll be some piece of the system that we'll call the directory that is, that's going to allow the storage manager to, for a given page ID to know at what file and what offset that page can be found in. OK? So we're not, the, the, the storage manager at the lowest level we're talking about here is typically not going to do replication. All right, it's not going to try to write the page multiple times. There'll be upper parts of the system that can do that. Right? If I, I know I need to write to different locations, because uh, you have to do this transactionally, that's above us. And then if they're doing like file system replication, like ZFS or, or RAID, all that is below us. And that's transparent to the storage manager stuff we're talking about here. OK? So this part gets confusing, but there's essentially three notion of pages in a database system. There's going to be a hardware page. This is what the, 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 the device actually exposes to us. Then there's the OS page. That's typically going to be four kilobytes. Um, and there's going to be a database page, what we care about. So the hardware page is the, uh, the sort of 
smallest size of data or the chunk of data that the storage device can guarantee it can write out atomically. So what do I mean, what do I mean by atomically? Yes. Let's say it again. Yeah, so what does that mean though, one transaction? Yes. So he says if you if you say write out this page, the hardware will guarantee that either is all of it's written or none of it's written. So if I want to write a four kilobyte page, either it's gonna fail and I, I get get back an error message, but when I come back, I won't have sort of partial data or all of it's gonna be written. If I need to write out two four kilobyte pages, I need to write eight kilobytes, I can write the first one and the hardware will guarantee that, but I can't it can't guarantee that it's gonna write the second one. Right? I'll have to do extra stuff up above to make sure that this is this actually happens. The OS page uh, in Linux and Windows, the default size is four kilobytes. There are uh, you do huge pages in Linux where you can have larger, uh, you can have sort of one page ID represent a larger chunk of, of pages in, in the OS. But again, underneath the covers, the hardware can't guarantee those things are written atomically, right? The thing that we're going to care about in, in uh, we're going to care about is uh, sorry, zoom. Uh, the thing we're going to care about is the database page, and this the size of this is going to vary based on the different database systems, right? So some systems by default, like SQLite, DB2, and Oracle, can do four kilobyte pages. SQL Server can do eight kilobyte and and pages with Postgres as well. And then MySQL is can do sixteen kilobytes. I think MySQL might be the largest that I that I know, the largest one I've seen so far. Um, and so, let me take a guess why you'd want to have different page sizes for your database system. Right, the hardware can do four kilobytes. Why would I maybe want to do something that's smaller, like in SQLite? Yes, because you can make less system calls with smaller page sizes. With larger pages, sure, yes. So he says, with if I have a larger page size, that I can do less system calls to do what though? Right, to do read and write. So again, sequential I/O. So if I if it, I have sixteen kilobyte pages in my SQL, which sort of I can say to the OS, give me at this offset. On this file, give me 16 kilobytes, and that's sequential I/O, right? Uh, in the high-end systems, and again, I'll refer to these enterprise systems like like Oracle, DB2, and SQL Server. These are systems that cost millions of dollars and have a lot of different ways you, you can configure them and tune them. In the in, in enterprise systems, you actually can change the page size on a per table basis, a per like index basis. You can say this table is going to be sequentially read all the time, so I want to use 16 kilobyte pages. And this, this table is going to be random access, so I'll do four kilobyte pages. You can't do that, I think, in SQLite. You can't do this in any, any of the open source systems that I know about. right? Again, so we can have larger page sizes in the database system, but the, the hardware can't guarantee that it's always going to be atomic. So we'll, again, this semester is about doing the extra stuff to make sure that we don't lose data when we write out chunks or write out pages that are larger than what the hardware can support. All right. So there'll be a bunch of different ways we can. Yes, question. So good, good point. So the question is, if I'm saying that with 16 kilobytes, if I can batch things together uh, and it's faster for sequential I/O, why doesn't everybody else do this? Well, again, think about what we talked about in the beginning: is random access versus sequential access. If I need one tuple, and that one tuple is 512 bytes, I got to go read 16 kilobytes to go fetch it in. Then I got to maintain 16 kilobytes in memory to, to, to you know to keep that that page in there, even though I maybe only want one one record. Right, so there's 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 trade-offs. This will be a recurring theme throughout the entire semester. There's no free lunch. There's pros and cons to all these different techniques, uh, and everybody everybody does something different. Yes. Uh, the question is, does, it, does this have to do with memory segmentation in terms of what? Uh, wait, what do you mean by waste? Like my example there, like like if I only need one record, I got to bring a 16 kilobyte page. Yeah, yeah so that, that's there's trade offs to this. Yes, yes. But I mean the with a larger page now also too, like in in the database system now with one page ID, I can represent 16 kilobytes. So my page table, uh, basically the, the hash table, where I do look up some page IDs to to frame in the buffer pool. That can be much smaller. Uh, and take take less space. Again, there's pros and cons to all these techniques. 
All right, so the, there, there's different ways we're going to manage the pages on files on disk. Um, for our purposes here, we're only going to really talk about the first one, heap files. Uh, the ISAM is kind of archaic. This is how they did stuff in the 70s. There are some systems that still do this. Um, the tree file we'll see when you index organize tables. So MySQL works this way. We'll, we'll come to that later. And then log structure is slightly different from all of these. But for, for, for this class here, we'll, just, we'll, assume, uh, we'll assume that it's a heap file. Um, so the basic idea of a heap file is that uh, the tuples are unsorted. All right, it's just it's a heap. It's just a bunch of, bunch of pages. And tuples can be placed any, anywhere inside of them, or the data can be placed any, anywhere inside of them. Um, the data won't be pre-sorted in any way. The tree one will, will give you that for free. ISAM gives you that for free as well. Um, I don't free. I mean, you have to maintain it, but like, you don't have to uh, do. You potentially sort up above in the execution engine. It comes. It comes back to you sorted. So again, at this point, we don't know anything what's inside of the pages. It's just about how do we find page one, two, three, or page four based on you know someone's request up above. So the heap file is going to be a collection of unordered pages that are stored in random order. And it's going to have sort of high-level operations like get a page, create a page, write to a page, and, and delete a page. Right? Um, the other important thing we need to have also is, supporting, is support iterating over the page. So if I want to do a sequential scan on a table uh, and I don't have an index or I don't have a data structure, I want to be able to say start at this, you know, start at the first page and keep giving me pages until I say stop. Right? So we need to be able to iterate them uh, as well. So this is super easy to do, a heap file like this, if there's only a single file, right? like in SQLite. You have uh, some requests that give you page two, and you know the starting address or the starting location of the file at you know, address zero. Uh, and you just take the page number you want, multiply it by the page size, because all the pages are going to be fixed size, and then you jump to that location to find what you need. Right? That's easy. Yes? The question is, how, do you know, how does the DMS know what index is and what page? Which tuples in which page? Oh, so what, how do I know that I should be getting page two? We'll get to that in a second. Yes. Right? Easy to do if it's a single file. I mean, there's typically going to be some header stuff in here in the front, right? But we'll, uh, we can ignore that. The SQLite actually, uh, manual, the SQLite documentation has a really great uh, explanation of what actually their, their single file looks like. I can, I'll post a link on Piazza afterwards. Um, the challenge, of course, is then if I have multiple files, if I get page two, you know, where do I go? Where, where do I jump to? Yes. What's the what? Sorry. The question is, what's the advantage of creating multiple files uh, in, in a database system versus like one giant file? Um, I mean, so you can take uh, you can take file locks on smaller pages and not have them block other threads. Um, it can potentially. Uh, Reduce like the 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 blast area. If like a file is deleted, you can essentially still recover other parts of the system. Um, those are the first two I, I, I can think of. Pretty much everybody does it this way. Um, you can other things you can do at the file system level. Uh, like if you have one directory for th this database, another directory for this database, you can then like on Linux, you can like sim, sim link them to different hardware devices. So maybe you have like a table that is super important, and you make sure that, that directory goes on to a really fast disk, another one goes on a slower disk, right? You want that kind of freedom. It's a good question. OK. So uh, if we, since we're assuming now the database is not in a single file, we need to keep track of what pages exist in multiple files and which ones have free space. So the, the textbook talks about a different ways. As far as I know, the most common one is called a page directory. Um, and basically, the, the, the data system is going to maintain some special pages that kind of look like a database, too, but it's just for keeping track of what's in our own database, where this directory is going to keep track of the data pages that, that people want and where the files are on, on the file system to go get it. right? And so we need to make sure that these directory pages are in sync with the database, so that we don't want to create a bunch of pages in, in the database heap file and then not update a page directory. And we crash, come back, and we've allocated a bunch of space that we don't know about anymore because uh, we never updated things. So there's, there's extra work we need to do to make sure our bookkeeping keeps things in track. Right, so now I have a bunch of pages. I don't care what, actually what file they're in. And then in my page directory, just think of it like a hash table lookup where I say, I want page two, and it knows where to find that page on disk, or at least what file and what offset it sh sh should be located in. Uh, and again, the page directory can be located in the, the file itself, like in SQLite, 
or in the case of Postgres and other systems, it'll be scattered across uh, separate files. And then we need to keep track of like what the, the number of free slots per page, and I'll explain what a slot is. I think it's like free space. And then we keep track of any pages that are free or empty. So if, I, if I, someone says, hey, create me a new page, I can check this list and say, oh, I have one that's empty and that's not being used, and give you that rather than going allocating a new one. Okay? So this is just, it's just, again, just think of it as a giant heap of pages, and there's some data structure that tells you where to find the data you want. Okay. So let's talk about what's actually inside the pages. So every page is going to contain a header uh, with some metadata about what's actually inside of it. So obviously, there'll be a, a, something like a page size, the checksum we talked about for check, checking whether the data is corrupted when you read, read and write some disk. Typically, you also see the version of the data system software that created it. Right? Every time you update Postgres to a new major version, they may change the page layout, but they still need to maintain compatibility for, uh, for any older pages or force you to upgrade to the, to the new layout. So you want, you want to know, you know what version of the software created the data that, that I'm looking at in a page. We'll talk about the transactions and visibility stuff later in the semester, but basically, you could keep track of, like, is this page, can, I, can my thread, my transaction actually see this page? Right? Or is it something in the future or something in the past that I, that I shouldn't see? And then if it supports compression, you also maintain some information about how the data is actually compressed, like what, what algorithm they, they used. Um, and as I said before, some systems require the page to be entirely self-contained. Oracle's most famous for this, so meaning in the header they have to contain, like, here's the table that, that here's the here's the table that this page came from. Here's the schema. Here's what the columns actually mean, right? And that way, if, if the system gets trashed, the file system gets corrupted, uh, and some page over here that contains the metadata of the schema for, for your table, if that gets lost, I can still look at this page and figure out what, what the data is actually located in. So when people talk about DBAs are expensive or, or enterprise systems are expensive, it's, it's for like insane things like disaster recovery where like the machine, you know, the machine caught on fire, but I was going to pull out disks before they melt, and maybe some of got corrupted. And a DBA would actually literally look at these page headers and figure out what, you know, for each page, what table does it belong to and try to reconstruct the table as much as possible. Nowadays, that's less of an issue because you can replicate off site. There's a bunch of, you know, Harvard's gotten much better to do this kind of things. But in the old days, when you did disaster recovery, it was literally like, you know, like looking for the black box on a, a plane crash, looking up the pages, what, what happened. Um, all right, so for now, for any, for any page short architecture, we need to decide how we're actually we're to organize the data inside the page. So we, we're always going to be a header that says what's the page, uh, what the page contains. And then now we need to talk about what's actually inside of it. So as I sort of alluded to already, the basic two approaches to do store data in a page, ignoring indexes, just dealing with tuples, will be a tuple-oriented approach and a log-oriented approach. So for this class here, we'll talk about tuple-oriented. And then next class, we'll talk about log, log-oriented. OK? So let's do a really simple uh, page layout scheme. So if you want to store tuples in a page, we have our header, and maybe just keep track of the number of tuples we have in our page, right? And then for a really simple approach is we just keep track of the number of tuples. And anytime somebody, uh, the, the data system wants to store a new tuple in our page, uh, we just look at the counter and figure out, oh, it's zero. And then I just you know, increment it by one and jump to the uh, to new offset and start writing the data. Right? Do you think this is a good idea or a bad idea? I'm setting up first. It's a bad idea, obviously. Uh, but why? Yes. So he says, if I delete a tuple from, from the, uh, the middle, uh, and I'm only looking at the number of tuples that I have in there, this doesn't tell me where the, actually, the, the free space is, right? So, so how am I going to know I can put another tuple here? What's another obvious problem? Yes. So he says, if you want to find a tuple, you have to like do what? A linear scan? Ignore that for now. Assume something else, something up above knows magically where to jump to the right offset in the page. So I'm assuming here all the tuples are at fixed size, the same length, right? So if they're all 64-bit integers, then sure, yeah, I know I, I have five 64 integers, so I take five times 64, ignoring nulls for now. But like, I've got to jump exactly where I want. 
right? But it, yes. Question, why can't you do a string null character? So you, in terms of what? Sorry to say there's empty space. Yeah? Yes? Uh, so his, so his, his proposal is that for each tuple, if I put a, the null terminating character at, at the end of the tuple, right? Assume there's nobody, no tuple storing that for now. Uh, I put a null terminating character at the end of every tuple, and that'll demark, have a demarcation to say this tuple has ended. Do we think that's a good idea or a bad idea? Bad idea, why? Correct. He says you basically have to do linear search, but now it's more than just linear search. Well, it liter well, it is linear search. But you, you got to examine bite by bite to see, see till you see the null terminator, and then when you do, it, okay, now I'm done. It's basically like C CSV parsing, right? Which is super slow. We don't want to do that. We can be smart about this, right? So, for all these reasons, and, and uh, you know, we're deleting things. How to fill in the free spot? Keep track of that. And also, variable length data is to be problematic as well. Right? Because you want to store email addresses, you want to store names, Android IDs, they're all going to be variable length. And you can do the char data type versus varchar, where you could have, uh, you could you know, allocate always 32 characters, no matter what size of the string it is, but that's being wasteful, right? Right? What if I want to have like a one megabyte field, which you can do, or even larger, but maybe some of them are only be 10 kilobytes? Do I want to allocate one meg for every single tuple? No, right? So they handle this, and the most common scheme uh, in sort of the the the, 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 the tuple-oriented page storage that we're talking about here is called slotted pages. The exact implementation of what uh, how you do slotted pages will vary from one system to the next, but the general idea is, is always going to be the same. The idea here is that we're going to have this slot array at the beginning of our page that's going to map tuples uh, tuple slots to the actual location in the page, right? So the slot array is always at the beginning, and then the all the tuples with fixed length and variable length data will be stored at the bottom, right? And the idea is that the slotted pages will tell you what offset you want to find the tuple that you're looking for. Right? So now if I want to go retrieve a tuple, if I want to retrieve tuple one, I just, all I need to know is the page ID and the slot offset. And once I get to the to, to inside the page, I look in the slot array and that tells me where to, you know, what byte offset to jump to to find the data that I'm looking for. Then now, as I insert more and more data into th this page, the slot array is going to grow from the beginning to the end. And then the, the, data, uh, the, data, the, the data of tuple data is growing from the end to the beginning. And at some point, I'm going to run out of space where I can't put a new tuple in, or I can't extend my slot array, and then the page is considered full. So this course can mean that I, I may have a little extra empty space because I can't fill things up. But that's the, the, the cost I'm willing to pay to have this indirection, right? To have, be able to support variable length tuples. So now if I want to, yes, question. The question is, how do you know the size? How do you know the size of the tuple? You would store it in the slot array. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 could, you could compute that as well, yes. Yes. The same it is the slot array. Each the, the each slot in the slot array is fixed size, right? So like sixteen bits, but the tuples themselves can be variable length. Yes. Yes. All right. So it says if you're deleting tuples, and let's say you want to delete tuple three, and now I have empty space here. How do I manage that fragmentation? It depends on the implementation, right? So you could just leave the old tuple where it was, everybody where they were, uh, or you could slide it over. And then now all you do is update your slot array and say, now tuple four here, because I slid it over, is now found at this location. It will vary. We'll, we'll do a demo. It'll vary per, per database system. When they, eventually, everyone will do compaction. Depends on when they actually want to do it. Yes. Her question is, when you slide this guy over, or slide tuple four over, does that mean you have to update all the other ones as well? 
yeah, within the page, yes. So, again, this goes back to uh, what I was saying before. We want to do as much work as we can while stuff's in memory. So I can move anything around I want inside this page because I have it in memory. I have it latched. We'll talk about that uh, in next week. But I basically have a lock on the page. I know nobody else is updating this page while I'm doing this. So I can do as much manipulation as, as I need. And now, the key important thing is that because the slot array is an indirection to the rest of the system, I can move where a page is located anywhere inside, or sorry, where a tuple is located anywhere inside the page, and I don't need to tell any other part of the system, right? So it's not like when I, when I slid tuple four over, I have to go tell whatever indexes I have on this table, oh, by the way, I moved tuple four. They don't know about that. All they know is like tuple four is at this page and this offset, and then I can move it where, anywhere I want. So who cares if I have to, fly, I have to move some data over? This is way cheaper than, than having to go fetch something from disk later on. Do you have a question as well or no? All right, so yes. So this question is, if you delete, if you, we well, say this guy here, tuple three was pointed by this slot, how do I mark that, it, that it's deleted? This is a bit up above, say so this slot is empty. All right, yes. Question, is the slot array fixed? Test implementation doesn't have to be. Right, because again, if I have variable length data, if I have, I, I could say in my table, you know, varchar 1024, so I, I have one kilobyte fields, but I only put one, one character in each of them, right? I don't want to pre-allocate because I don't know what the data is going to be going into it. So the slot, the slot array typically will grow. Yes. Will we, will we do sliding the slot array? What do you mean by that? Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, will, will we reclaim space in the slot array? Uh, if it's unused, actually, that one I don't know, right? But the slot array is typically not the, the it's not going to be the, 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 the bulk of the space in, in that page. All right, cool. So let's get into this thing that I've been talking about. Like, how do we actually identify tuples, right? And it sort of goes back to the point I was making before about like I can change the location of a of a tuple in a in a page, uh, but it maintains the same slot number, and I don't have to update indexes, right? So a database system is going to maintain what is called a record ID. Uh, different database systems will call them different things. Postgres will be CTID. Uh, MySQL will be row ID. SQLite so row ID. Like they're all, but it, it, the high level idea is going to be the same thing. And it's going to be a unique identifier that's going to say, here's how to find the physical location of a logical, single logical tuple. And so we don't have to get this just yet. You could have a single logical tuple have multiple physical versions. Uh, and how you actually find what version you want, we will cover later in the semester. But just assume that I have a one to one mapping from one physical. One logical tuple maps to one physical tuple. And so the record ID tells you where to go find this thing. Um, the page ID plus offset is the most simplest way to think about this. And the offset is just the slot number in the slot array and the page it's located on. You can contain additional information. We'll see this in SQL Server, like what file is it in. Uh, in Oracle, you can keep track of like what uh, table space it's in, like what directory and so forth, right? So uh, in Postgres, the CTID will be six bytes. In SQLite, it would be 8 bytes. And then, row, and then the, the row, row ID in uh, Oracle is 10 bytes. The SQL Server, I think, is, is 8 bytes as well. I might be wrong with that, though. And so I'll show an example now in some demos. We can see this. We can actually see what the, the, these IDs are. But we don't want to rely on them in our application because the database systems are free to change them anytime they want. right? And again, this is sort of abstraction or separation between logical and physical. I'll still have my logical tuples. I, I know what they are, but how the, where they're actually physically stored and how they're physically stored, I shouldn't care, and I don't want to care. Okay. All right. So let me switch over to. Can you access what? Yeah. Yeah. So his question is, can you can you actually access this? Yes. Let's do it. All right, so let's do Postgres first. So we're going to create a simple table. 
right? Uh, that has three tuples. That's embarrassing. Okay. Right, three three tuples, right? With with you know with, with these values. So in Postgres, what you can do is they have this again, the CTID. I think of this as like a virtual column where I can get back the the pair of page number and slot number. Right? So you can see here I inserted three tuples and the CTID is all you know zero one, zero two, zero three. Right? So page zero, slot one, page zero, slot two, and so forth. Okay. So now if I delete delete one of these guys. What's that, sorry? Okay. So I, I, I delete a tuple, and then I run that query again. Now you can see that uh, it, I deleted the second tuple, uh, but it kept the other ones where they were located, 0, 1, 0, 3, right? What's that? We can insert something, yes, he's very excited. Sure. <laughs> okay, so we insert this tuple. All right, so you think it's gonna be, so we, we, we have 0, 1, 0, 3, so we have a free space in 0, 2. Do we think it's going to put it in 0, 2 or append it after 0, 4? Or so 0, 3, make it 0, 4. He says 0, 4. Raise your hand if you think 0, 2. Yeah, small amount. Raise your hand if you say 0, 4. More people. Okay. 0, 4. All right? Is that correct or wrong? No, it's, who cares, right? It's fine. I did whatever I wanted to do. So in Postgres, they had this thing called the vacuum. This again, we'll cover this later on. But think of this as just the, like the garbage collector or just you know defrag defragmenter for for the database system. And we're going to run it on this table. And now when I run the query again, now it moved moved it to to fill in the free space, right? Zero one zero two zero three. Where before it was zero zero one zero three zero four. Right. Yes. The question is, is, does this mean in Postgres we can't have a column with called CTID? Uh, let's find out. Nope, doesn't let you do it. Yes. Yeah, so this question is, uh, at least in Postgres, there's this notion of like, like R dot star. These are all like the user, user defined columns. But there's all these other ones that are in the header of the tuples that you don't get by default. But if you know what they are, you can get them. All right. So another one, I think I'm gonna, I think it's R dot min max. Add. Oh, come on. Now there's a bunch of other ones related to timestamps and visibility stuff, which you can do as well. Um, that, that you can get, but like R star typically won't return this. All right, so in Postgres, what you can do, you can actually, uh, you can address tuples with their CTID. You're not, you shouldn't, but you can, right? Right? So again, is this a, is this a bad idea? Yes, because I ran the vacuum, and then the, the location of the tuples physically changed, right? All right, so let's go to uh, let's do SQLite. I think I need to make the table first. Um, so SQLite has this thing called row ID, right? So row one, two, three, four, and then if I delete a tuple and I and then insert a new one, let's see what happens. So I delete it. It's zero three. And I, I, I insert one, and that's one, three, four, All right? So again, is, is it correct? Doesn't matter. We don't care. All right, last one we'll do uh, SQL Server. Oracle is also an interesting one, but I don't have the, I couldn't get the work in Docker correctly, so we'll pass on that. All right, we create the table. So. Uh, in SQL Server, they don't have a, they don't have like a row ID thing. They have this this function you can get to get back uh, data. Now you see in their sort of row ID, it's it's not just 
page and offset. It's like file number, page, and then offset. Right? And Oracle would have even more things. So now if I call delete, run this again, and it's 0, 2, so it, it, it didn't do compaction. Uh, if I insert, run again, now, now it changed. Or, or it started into it. Right? Actually, no, sorry. Not only did it insert into it, the tube up here, this was 0, 2. When I inserted it, now became uh, in, in position 1 or slot 1. Right? So what Seagull Server is trying to do here, because it says, oh, I know this page is in memory. I have a, I have a latch on it. Let me try to you know, tighten it up, remove, remove uh, dead space, before I insert the new tuple into it. Yes? The question is, when, when, when these systems do compaction, are they doing it on a page at a time versus incremental? We mean incremental, like incremental within a page? Of a page? No, no, no. The question is, would you ever do compaction? We ever do compaction on a subset of a page? No, because again, the page is four kilobytes or eight kilobytes, right? It's super small. Where you would see compaction is again, in Postgres, like this, this thing called the auto vacuum. Uh, it will try to it, it tries to keep track of like what pages got updated since the last time I ran the vacuum, and it only tries to compact those. And then I think only on our vacuum full, which is more expensive to do, will it try to say. This page is half full, this page is half full, and we merge them together into to a new page. And they typically try to clean up pages by themselves because it's just faster to do. Yes. So his question is for the systems that, that do vacuum, it's pretty much only Postgres, right? Uh, do they require you to manually run the vacuum, or they try to run vacuum for you automatically? Uh, has, Postgres, the answer is they do try to do it automatically, uh, but they try to be, uh, how do I say this? They don't want to interfere with queries, right? Because the vacuum is going to take latches, it take lock clocks, it's very expensive to do. So they have back off mechanisms to say, if I try to, I want to vacuum this page, but some other query holds it, They'll back off, right? And, and maybe sleep for a while and come back again. So at some point, you definitely have to vacuum. We'll talk about this later in the semester. Uh, I, really, I keep previewing stuff coming up, but there's, there's a lot of things to cover. Um, like, you can get in a bad situation. It's called the transaction ID wraparound in Postgres, where if I run out of 32 bit numbers for transactions, I got to run the vacuum to reset back to zero. And so if you don't run vacuum and you hit that, the system can't do anything and it, and it, it dies. Uh, so, like, in that case, you definitely, if, if, if the vacuum can't keep up because it keeps backing off, you can tune the knobs to make it be more aggressive in how it vacuums. It'll slow down your queries while the vacuum runs, but at least you can clean things up to avoid that, that transaction ID wraparound clip. The question is, since Postgres is the only one that's doing uh, the manual vacuuming, is, is uh, do other ones just find some time to do it randomly? Yeah, so they'll have, um, I mean, so, so, so the vacuum command in Postgres is not in the SQL standard. That's a Postgres thing. Uh, like an Oracle, I think by default, they run it at like 11, like 11 p.m. at night. They'll run some maintenance stuff, and then they, they can do compaction down. I don't know what SQL Server does, but typically there's, it's, it's like a background maintenance job that runs in cron every so often to clean things up. Uh, in... There's a command called optimize in the SQL in the SQL standard uh, where you can optimize tables and that sort of it's just basically like the vacuum. Um, you can do that for indexes too. Yeah, you 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 can run it manually. I, I just don't. It's not in the standard. It varies per system. The we'll get to this later. The way Postgres does multi versioning uh, is that every time you update a tuple, you copy the whole tuple, and put it in another location. So. You build, you want to, so you, you have basically the vacuum has to scan through and try to find all the, the dead tuples and clean them up. That's the wrong way to do multi versioning. Uh, uh, MySQL and Oracle and others do it better, where you, anytime you update a tuple, you copy the, you, like, a, like a get diff, you copy the old version in a, a single location and only updated one tuple. So now when I want to go clean some things up, it's like one file, one piece of memory, I just go blow away and I remove all the old versions. Postgres has to scan to find them.
All right, cool. Any other questions? Awesome. So again, the main takeaway from this is everybody's going to do something different. Um, and but the high level idea is, is still the same. OK. So uh, just to finish up quickly, what's inside a tuple? So a tuple is essentially just, just going to be a sequence of bytes. And again, it's up to the upper parts of the database system to interpret those bytes and make sense of them, like to know what the scheme is, to know what the attributes are, and what, what the, the types are, and how to understand what's, what's going on. So in every tuple, there's going to be a header, and it's going to contain metadata about what's in when the tuple itself. So there'll be visibility info, like is this tuple deleted or not? Like we'll cover that later. Um, typically, they're going to represent nulls with the bitmap that basically says for this, you know, is for this attribute if it's null, there's a bit set. There's other ways to represent null. We'll do we'll do next class, but um, this is the most common one. And then within the tuple itself, you typically don't store the metadata about what what's inside of it. Right, it's either done at the page level, like an Oracle, or in some other catalog stored separately, right? And again, the, the, all the data within a tuple, for a tuple at a logical level, doesn't necessarily need to be stored at its, what I'll call the, the primary storage location of, of, in a page. For variable length data, you can instead, in the tuple itself, you can have pointers to some other page that has the data that you want. Like for really large fields, you can have a pointer to somewhere else. And we'll cover that next class, all right? One tricky, one clever thing you can do is uh, in some systems will allow you to store data from multiple tables in a single tuple with itself. So this sort of violates the thing I talked about earlier, where I said every page will typically only store data for just one table. There are some systems where you can actually embed data that's related to a tuple within the tuple itself. So this is called denormalization. Uh, and the basic idea is that if I have a, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. So if, if I have a uh, two tables like this, where one has a foreign key reference to the other table, so I could just store them as separate pages, right? But now anytime I want to go get all the data for a, a table or record in foo, uh, if I want all the rows that are related to it in, in, the, in the bar table, I got to go fetch two fetch, sep, sep, yeah, do a join and fetch two separate pages. But some systems will let you embed the tuples for the related tables in the in the, in, the, in the original, the, the base tuple itself, right? So I have this example here for foo. I have A and B, the attributes that belong to foo. But then I have this variable length piece that belongs to all the tuples that are related to it. Now, logically, it's still to the application, it's still going to look like these are two separate tables, right? But underneath the covers, I can embed them to make things faster, right? Because now, again, for, for go reading one record in foo, where I want also the records of, that relate to it in bar, it's one page fetch, right? So your statement is this makes writing more expensive in this case? Uh, no, so, so instead of having two separate pages, like I take all the all these guys here and I embed it inside of this one, this one here. So I don't have the original one, right? It does make updates more expensive potentially because uh, now if I want to update I just update the one record in like one attribute in foo, I get the the the, the, the tuple is now bigger because I've embedded all this other stuff. I potentially need to extend the, if I keep adding records to it that relate to it in bar, I keep extending this array and I maybe re re resize my pages. It doesn't come for free, but it makes the reads go faster. Yes? So this question is, how do you actually figure out whether this is a good idea or not, depending on your application? Uh, some systems, in theory, a relational database system could figure this out for you automatically. As far as I know, nobody does this. Uh, the systems that do support this, um, like Spanner is probably the most famous one that does this. Akaban was a database startup that could do, sometimes it's called pre-join, could do this as well. Uh, but in those, you have to create, when you create the tables, you specify, I want this embedded inside of this other one. Right? As far as I know, no system will figure this out for you automatically. This technique, though, also looks like, like a lot like the document model we talked about in the first class uh, from all these sort of uh, NoSQL systems, because that's essentially what they're doing. But again, they're doing this manually. You're trying to say, I know that these, these two collections of documents are, are similar to each other. Like for, this, for a customer, here's all their orders. And I can embed them manually inside of the, uh, in, in the, in the collection itself. 
The difference though, in a relational database, I would still have two logically separate tables. I could still query them separately, uh, but underneath the covers, since I always know maybe I'm gonna join foo with bar, it makes sense to embed them ahead of time. Right? Yes. Does this require larger storage? Why? Why would it? Yes. Uh, so again, going back to my example here, like when I, when I created the table, like this is a, this is a uh, one end relationship. So for one tuple in foo, I have n tuples in bar, right? So I just take those n tuples, and, 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 and those n tuples can only belong to one in, in foo. So it's just copying them directly in. So you're not gonna have duplicates in this example here. In the document model, if you just blindly do this, then yes, you could have a bunch of duplicates. And then, again, think of this, we're at the physical level here. The application, what we're talking about here is the application doesn't know, doesn't care that things got embedded, even though I could tell it I wanted to embed it. The, the system itself can figure this out for you, right? All right, just to finish up quickly about this. Um, so, wait, wait, let's take the class. So this is called, again, this is called denormalization. The NoSQL guys would call this pre-joins. Uh, this is not a new idea. This is done by IBM did this in the 1970s. They abandoned it because it was a pain to maintain. Um, and then several systems can do this, again, if you define it in your, in your table statement. Um, I was gonna, what I was gonna make. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, it'll, it'll come to me later. Okay, so in this class today, we talked about how to organize database and pages. We then talk about how to keep track of those pages in our directory. Then we talk about the different ways to actually store them. Uh, and then we have different ways to actually represent tuples. So next class, we'll go through log structure storage. Well, how do we actually represent the values and attributes? And then catalogs to keep track of everything. Dang cold, it's taking its toll. I got a pack of zigzags, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a duck, show some love. Three for 50, is you with me? What I'm speaking of? I'm in the studio at nine, so it's song. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears Town Street sound. Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snakes.